Thank you very much, Father Greg. Well, wonderful, so many people here. I thought all the wet weather, it's just going to be me and my wife. <laughs> God bless you for coming out in this weather and uh, it says a lot for your faith. So, um, yeah, tonight we're going to talk about divine mercy and we, we sort of have this provocative title, Why is Divine Mercy Sunday like no other Sunday? And um, we probably need to lay a good foundation before we actually answer that question. So that's what we want to do tonight, is have a look at this. When we talk about Divine Mercy, generally you have the first thing that comes up, well, what's so new about mercy? Mercy is the gospel message. You know, why, why, is it, why is it special? But Jesus told St. Faustina that we have not comprehended his mercy. And um, I think, I hope by the end of this night, you'll say, my gosh, we didn't comprehend his mercy because it really is amazing. Our story starts um, with St. Faustina. And, but oddly enough, we're not going to talk too much about St. Faustina. What we want to talk about tonight is what Jesus said to St. Faustina. And she was born in Poland in uh, 1905. She lived the same years as Jesus, 33 years, and she died on the 5th of October. But between 1930 and 1938, Jesus appeared to St. Faustina and told her that he wanted to reveal to her about his mercy. And the way she would do this is to record a diary. And um, it's quite a, a massive work, uh, the diary, the book itself. Um, I think I've got a shot of it there. There it is. It's, it's quite a thick book, but it's, it's a very easy read. And I would highly recommend it to be on everybody's um, spiritual bookshelf because it's like a wonderful love story. And all the bits that Jesus speak are in bold. And what makes this diary so interesting is that it's mechanical dictation. So he called her my secretary and he would often say, he'd start the, the, the phrase with write. She, she literally would mechanically dictate. And so that's exciting because we get a sense. I, I've been doing these talks for many years and one day I was preparing and the Holy Spirit put it on my heart Look at the style of the writing. Look at the intensity of some of the words. Oh my gosh, it just changed everything for me. So as we go through, you'll see some words in italics. And, and this is my emphasis, but it's just words to me that jumped out that I consider very powerful and just worth thinking about. So we'll, we'll have a look at that. This message is very much linked with Pope John Paul II, gosh, we could, we could do a talk alone just on his involvement. We don't have time tonight. And I am conscious of the time you've come out, so I'm, I'm really going to try and keep to the 8 o'clock finish. So I know some of you need to go, and it is terrible weather, by all means, right? But for those who might have a little bit of time afterwards, we might actually pray the Chaplet of Mercy afterwards, if, if you're not tired. But please, at 8 o'clock, if you need to go, just go. I, no, no one be offended. But one of the amazing things he said, he brought in the Feast of Mercy. Jesus asked for this. Now, I heard about Divine Mercy in the 80s, right? And so I'm reading this thing where Jesus says to Faustina, to have, the, have the church declare a Feast of Mercy. And all through the 80s and 90s, I've got documents, still got them at home, by his, Theologians who say it'll never happen. You can't have a feast of mercy on a Sunday. It's never going to happen. Well, someone should have told John Paul that because on the year 2000, when he canonized St. Faustina, he instituted the feast of mercy. It's, it's an amazing thing. But he turned around and he said at the gathering afterwards, he said, this is the happiest day of my life. Now, coming from a man, if you know anything about John Paul and the huge things he's done in his life, for him to say that, it must be a big deal. And it was, because he saw that this was one of the key things of his pontificate, was to declare this feast. And he called this millennium 
the whole millennium, the millennium of mercy. So we're, we're, we're in it now. So we've got some aims of this talk. The first one is, I hope by the end of this, you are in awe of God's mercy and the very unique gift of Divine Mercy Sunday and why it's so special. Number two, have a clear understanding the difference between justice and mercy. If you walk away tonight with only this, it will be really valuable and do you well. Number three, the realization that God loves you much more than you thought. I mean, it never ends, does it? We're just, each day we grow, we, we, we realize how much we're loved, you know, but it really is amazing. And we're called to be apostle of mercy. So then you take this message of, and it's a beautiful message, it's full of joy, full of hope. You take this message out to others and be apostle of good news to others. And fourth, realize the importance of having complete trust in your relationship with God and why that is critical at the hour of your death. Okay, you know they used to have the, most of you are old enough to remember Dave Letterman like me, right? They used to have the top 10 every night. Well, this is the top 20 mind-blowing statements that Jesus said to St. Faustina. They're not in any order and of course there's more than 20, but I just picked 20 out because uh, they, they blew my mind, so I'll share them with you. Okay, so at the end here, you see a little reference diary. That's where if you see something that really touches your heart, you can make a mental note of that diary. If you actually Google it, it'll come up. Or better still, I've got a little piece of paper at the back there on that back table. If you want, would like a copy of my notes, which will have everything that we've got tonight, if you just want to put your email address, please write clearly because half the time I can't read them. I'm happy to send you my notes. So everything we will cover tonight, if something really touches your heart, just put it in there and you can have the whole thing. In fact, what's in the notes is a lot more than what we're going to do tonight. So these are Jesus' words, right? Jesus says, I cannot punish even the greatest sinner if he makes appeal to my compassion. But on the contrary, I justify him in my unfathomable and inscrutable mercy. See the power of those words? Why did Jesus use those powerful words? Right. Before I come as just judge, I first open wide the door of my mercy. He who refuses to pass through the door of my mercy must pass through the door of my justice. Now in the church we use justice to mean a lot of things. In this diary, Jesus uses it in a very specific way. And what he's saying is that there are, there are like two doors. One is justice and one is mercy. It's up to us which door we go through. Why is this important? Well, what is justice? In the way that Jesus uses the term here, justice is when you get what you deserve. You do the crime, you do the time, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to get what I deserve. Thank you very much. So, I don't want to go through the door of justice. Mercy is the compassion that you get that you do not deserve. Right? You hear people say, oh, he doesn't deserve mercy. Well, of course he doesn't. If someone deserves mercy, it's not mercy, it's justice. Right? So, see, how, see the difference. Every time you hear that word mercy from now on, think, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Lord, have mercy. I don't deserve it. But in his goodness, he does. If you get that, that helps you start straight away appreciate the significance of mercy. So Jesus is saying, if you don't come through the door of mercy, you'll have to come through the door of justice. There's no escaping. If you ignore this door, you will automatically come through this door. Right? One of the big things, you hear people talk about um, uh, God's mercy and, and then they say, how can God be merciful and loving if he sends people to hell? Right? Now it's a good question. So you find that people slip into either one or two camps. They say, oh well, you know, hell, well, it's not really there or it's only for the people like the Adolf Hitlers and that, you know, and they try and water down hell. The problem with that is that just about everything we know about hell 
comes from the lips of Jesus in Scripture. So we can't really, in all honesty, dismiss that. So how do we tension that then against a loving God? Well, this is the answer, justice and mercy. If you, if you come through the door of justice, you get what you deserve. Is that not fair? Is that not fair? That's justice, right? But if you come through the door of mercy, wow, you wait what's going to unfold. A tidal wave of mercy that will blow your mind, right? But the choice is ours, justice or mercy. Jesus says, proclaim that mercy is the greatest attribute of God. If someone had asked you, what's the greatest attribute of God, would you have said mercy? A few years ago, I wouldn't have. All the works of my hands are crowned with my mercy. I desire that the whole world know my infinite mercy. I desire to grant unimaginable graces to those souls who trust in my mercy. Think of the thing that you want the most. Well, you know what? Jesus wants to give you something even bigger, so bigger that you haven't even imagined it. And almost certainly, it's not a material thing. It's, it would be something for your spiritual life, and that's probably why we haven't imagined it. But, you know, a lot of you people here, you know, you, you've lived life, you've lived the challenges, Maybe you've been able, you'll be able to look back and say, well, one of my unimaginable graces might be, it turned out to be in the beginning, the biggest cross I ever had in my life. But it proved in the long run to be an unimaginable grace. So this is the kind of gifts that our God wants to give us. And we've all, we've all got unimaginable graces. Jesus says, oh, if sinners knew my mercy, they would not perish in such great numbers. There's a sound warning. Tell sinful souls not to be afraid. Fear is the tool of Satan. Not to be afraid to approach me. Speak to them of my great mercy. The loss of each soul plunges me into mortal sadness. Can you feel the cry of the heart of Jesus here? You console me when you pray for sinners. The prayer most pleasing to me is the prayer for the conversion of sinners. Know, my daughter, that this prayer is always heard and answered. People say, oh, Jesus never answers my prayers. He's telling us he always answers this prayer. I desire that you know more profoundly the love that burns in my heart for souls and you will understand this when you meditate upon my passion. So meditating on the passion of Jesus is not just for Lent. It's something that we should do all the time. And of course we have the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary. It's a beautiful way to do it. Jesus says, call upon my mercy on behalf of sinners. I desire their salvation. When you say this prayer with a contrite heart, and with faith on behalf of some sinner i will give him the grace of conversion this is the prayer O blood and water which gush forth from the heart of jesus as a fountain of mercy for us i trust in you took me what seven seconds to say that seven seconds you can save a soul guaranteed jesus words don't, don't waste seven seconds, you know. We watch so much time television, just a few seconds can transfer a soul. Tell the world about my mercy and my love. The flames of mercy are burning me. I desire to pour them out upon human souls. Oh, what pain they cause me when they do not want to accept them. Can you hear Jesus' heart here? just wanting to pour out gifts but they don't want to accept them they won't ask do what is within your power to spread devotion to my mercy i will make up for what you lack get this one tell aching mankind to snuggle close to my merciful heart and i will fill it with peace when was the last time you heard Jesus say, snuggle close? You know? 
Why is he using these words? Yeah, he's using these words to try and break through. We've got, oh yeah, we, we know mercy, yeah, good. Yeah, Jesus died for me, yeah, good. Like, it's, hello, it's not getting in. He's trying to use these words to touch our hearts. Okay, so the message of divine mercy is so important for the whole world that Jesus has given us four gifts so that we will take this message seriously. Now, it's kind of ironic. We don't deserve anything. He's coming to give us mercy, but he'll give us four gifts so that we open up to the mercy. <laughs> Just think about that for a while. It blows your mind. What are the four gifts? The first one is the image of mercy, the hour of mercy, the chaplet of mercy, and, of course, the Feast of Mercy. And we want to just briefly go through these. So as we said, Jesus appeared to St. Faustina like this. And one time he appeared to her, he had these rays coming from his heart, the red and the, representing the blood and the white representing the water, right? So the red represents his blood as in the passion and his death, and the white represents the waters of baptism and it's through these that we are saved and he said to saint faustina paint an image according to the pattern you see with the signature jesus i trust in you now whose signature is it it's our signature so he's saying we uh, should be saying jesus i trust in you now if jesus appeared to us do you think he would have said and said, give me a good caption for this? Huh? I think I would have said, oh, Jesus, we love you. Jesus, you're all powerful. Oh, honestly, I wouldn't have said, Jesus, I trust in you. Right? But it's big. Trust is big, much bigger than we realise. Jesus says, I promise that the soul that will venerate this image will not perish. Hello? Like, that's a huge statement. We'll come back to that. I also promise victory over its enemies here on earth and especially at the hour of death. I myself will defend it as my own glory. So, so what is Jesus saying? Is he saying, what does venerate the image first of all? Okay, I've got an image of divine mercy here. I'm gonna venerate the image. I'm gonna walk up, I'm gonna go, kiss Jesus, I trust in you. Took me two seconds, I venerated the image. So is Jesus saying, that's all I've got to do and um, I won't perish? I don't have to go to Mass on Sunday? So I don't have to... Obviously he's not saying that. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, if you venerate the image, I'll give you the grace to be faithful to the things that we know we have to do for our spiritual life. There's a lot of grace in this image. We have a lot of images in our churches. This one has a very special grace. And when it was first painted, St. Faustina, she cried because she said, look, nothing like you. And Jesus said, the power of this image is not in the brush. Right? It's in the grace that's behind it. So it's a very special image. Jesus said, I will save those cities and houses in which this image will be found. And likewise, I will protect the persons who will honour and trust in my mercy. That's another huge thing. I have one of these in my home. This is actually my one I have at home. I remember once my neighbour, well, I live in the cul-de-sac, my neighbour said to me, you know, Paul, every one of us here, we've all been broken into and robbed. Well, every house here. I didn't say anything because I didn't want to be like a smart aleck, but I said to myself, not our house. And not because we have great security, but we have divine mercy image looking after us. I really believe that. But anyway, um, Woe the day when we don't have a giant divine mercy image over Sydney, huh? in, in, in Oxford Street. Huh? Wouldn't that be wonderful? All right. Jesus says, The grace of my mercy are drawn by means of one vessel only, and that is trust. The more a soul trusts, the more it will receive. Souls that trust boundlessly are great comfort to me because I pour all the treasures of my graces into them. I rejoice that they ask for much, because it is my desire to give much. And in case we didn't get it, he says, very much. Right? So, you know, how often do we pray, oh, 
I'm asking so many things, I better not put too much into the prayer. It might kind of drain the, the power. It's, like, it's not the way Jesus thinks, right? He wants us to ask for much. He wants us to come and ask for all that we need. Jesus says, pray as much as you can for the dying. By your entreaties, obtain for them trust in my mercy, because they have the most need of trust and have it the least. The grace of eternal salvation for certain souls in their final moment depends upon your prayer. Sooner would heaven and earth turn into nothingness than would my mercy not embrace a trusting soul. Wow, wow, wow. That's huge. There are so many stories I can tell you. First of all, what happens at the hour of death, right? So the hour of death, we see our lives. We see all, all our lives and we see those areas that we failed. And it doesn't matter who it is, we're all in for a shock, right? We're all going to go, because we're not only going to see our sin, we're going to see the effects of our sin, what it did to our family, our neighbour, what that in turn did to somebody else. It's a little terrifying, right? So what do we do? Jesus is saying, trust. Because at that moment, here's your door again. You want to come through the door of justice, get what you deserve, or you want to come through my mercy? I'll come through the mercy. How do I get mercy? Trust. Trust. And of course, live it. Now, if in fact you have um, a pretty bad life, you're going to see your sin. So what are you going to do? Unfortunately, some people will despair. If you haven't built a relationship with Jesus and understand how loving he is, understanding how much trouble he went to to save you, understanding the power of the, of the cross and the trust, your human logic is going to say, there's no way in the world I'm saved. I, justice, my, justice tells me I deserve that, so I'm going to send myself to hell. And that's what St. Faustina says, and many other saints say, Jesus sends no one to hell, we send ourselves. Right? And when souls do that, Jesus and Mary, they weep. Because he wants them to say, Lord, I'm a sinner, but you're a greater saviour. And I throw myself at the foot of the cross, and I trust in your mercy. Because all through my life, I've had experiences where everything seemed to fall apart but you were still there and so you taught me trust trust and so i'm going to stand on your promise and i'm going to trust and jesus is going to smile and say welcome home brother welcome home now if you're really bad you might have to purify you via the purgatory right but there's good news about that too we'll, we'll come to that all right the other story i quickly want to tell you how powerful this is i've said uh, you know, you will get these calls, right? You better come and see so and so, your relative, friend, whatever. They're dying. They, they, they only got like 24 hours to live. If you don't come now, you won't see them. I've had that type of a call for three times. They're horrible calls. But I go and I sit and I pray the chapel of mercy. And sometimes I can pray it openly, sometimes I can't. But I stand on Jesus' words that that, will, that person will be saved. One of the most powerful stories is my, my good mate. He was best man at my wedding. He comes from Singapore, him and his wife. And Catherine got the call one day from the rest of the family in Singapore. Your brother-in-law is dying. If you want to see him, you better come to Singapore now. So she jumps on an airplane, she goes. So the brother-in-law, so it's Catherine's sister. She's Catholic, but her husband is Buddhist. So all his family around the bed, and they were in the hospital all day and she really couldn't do anything. And so what she did was she taught his kids to say the chaplet of mercy. She said, look, she said, look, your dad's dying. You need to pray for him. Pray the chaplet of mercy. So these beautiful kids praying. Chaplet of mercy. How powerful are the kids' prayers, right? Really powerful. So what happens? It's about midnight now. Most of his family are gone. In the hospital room is just him, her sister, and another man and she said I'm just falling asleep I was just sitting in the chair asleep and he's in the bed and he's restless thrashing the bed clothes 
He's not, he's not in a good state. Anyway, she says, I hear this voice. Why are you sleeping? Wake up. So she, <laughs> absolutely shocked, right? And so she, she starts praying the chaplain. And then she starts talking to him about Jesus. And he said, well, you know, I'm Buddhist. I don't really know. And so she said, no, no, Jesus is the only one who can save you. And she starts talking about Jesus and mercy and the cross and salvation, right? Meanwhile, her sister's standing there thinking, wow, I've never seen my, my sister's got, must do this great ministry. And she said to her later, is this the kind of work you do in Sydney? And Catherine said, I've never done it before in my life. <laughs> it was just that prompt that she got to start sharing, right? So she's telling him all of this. And then she gets this thing, she says, you know, there's no priest around, but I could baptize you and you could become a Christian if you want, but you'd have to really want it. And he said, I want it, I want it, I want it. Catherine gets up, picks up the plastic cup, goes over to the sink, puts water in it, walks up to him and says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. She said he couldn't believe it. Immediately, this peace descended over this guy. He no longer thrashing in the bedclothes. He could start to open his eyes more. And he's looking around. And he starts talking about the love he has for his family. He's talking about love, but love. And then he says, oh, look, I'm really tired now. I'm going to rest. And so he, he puts his head down. Anyway, he passed away. He passed away at three in the morning. Anyway, the next morning, in, in Singapore Asian custom, they have the wake before the funeral. So all the family are there, and there's another cousin who's Catholic. And she came up to Catherine and said, I had a strange dream last night. She said, I dreamt I saw Jesus carrying my uncle. It was in the middle of the night. She said, I just got up and started praying the chaplet of mercy. And she said, but I thought, no, that can't be right. He's Buddhist. And Catherine says, have I got a story to tell you? <laughs> so, you know, my own mother, my own mother passed away and I had the joy of being able to, the last 10 minutes of her life, she was listening to the Chaplet of Mercy. So God is good in these things and this is powerful stuff, man. This is really powerful stuff. Jesus says, I desire trust from my creatures. Encourage souls to place great trust in my fathomless mercy. Look at that word, fathomless, bottomless, no limit. Let the weak, sinful soul have no fear to approach me. Get this line. For even if it had more sins than there are grains of sand in the world, all would be drowned in the immeasurable depths of my mercy. More sins than the grains of sand in the world? We're talking about the Adolf Hitlers, the Saddam Husseins. Well, maybe we even put Vladimir Putin in there. But whatever, right? This is, this is full on serious stuff. Jesus is saying it's possible for these people to be saved if they humbly repent and trust in my mercy. Now, obviously, those kind of guys um, could be spending a lot of time in purgatory. <laughs> Thousands of years, maybe. But it's better than being lost. But unfortunately, the reality is that those souls like that generally are not capable of turning to God in trust. Um, that's the sad part. And so that's why we have to get into this practice and do it now in our life so that at the hour of our death, it will be one of joy, uh, rejoicing and joy. Do you recall a story from the Gospels? The story where um, the um, centurion, the Roman centurion, asked Jesus to heal his servant who was near death. Right? So he wasn't even Jewish. He was a Roman centurion. And he said to Jesus, I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. Just give the word and my servant will be cured. And Jesus was just astonished. Not even in all of Israel have I found faith like this. So... Is it a big deal? Think about it. A non-Jew proclaims his trust in Jesus. He gets rewarded by having what he said put into the scriptures for all time. But not only that, in every mass throughout the world to this day, we still say before communion, paraphrasing those words, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. Say the word and I be healed. 
That is the power of trust. Every time you have that before communion, hear the priest say that prayer, think of the power of trust. Matthew's Gospel. We all know Judas betrayed Jesus. But do you know he was sorry? Scripture says he deeply regretted what he had done. And he even confessed, I have sinned. I have betrayed innocent blood. Compare that to the sin of Peter. Peter had a very privileged position. You know, when John Paul was around, they used to say, oh, John Paul was the greatest pope since Peter, implying that Peter was the greatest pope. And I'd say, yeah, okay. Question, who's the only pope to deny Christ three times under oath? Oh, Peter, <laughs> right? So I put it to you that Peter's sin is just as bad, if not worse, than Judas's sin. What's the difference? One went on to be head of the church, one went and hung himself. Could you imagine if Judas had trusted in God's mercy? The difference between them is that they failed to trust in God's mercy. And the good news is that Peter's love matured only after he had experienced that mercy of Jesus. I hope in your life sometime there's a confession where you can say, man, that was the confession of my life. I poured my heart out and I could feel the mercy of God embrace me and it changed my life. Really, every confession should be that. But in practice, you know, I hope that somewhere in your life you've had that kind of experience because it's life-changing. It's absolutely... And what makes it life-changing? You experience the mercy of God and you really can only do it until you've hit the bottom, until you've failed like Peter did, denied him under oath three times, but comes back and Jesus not only forgives him, but he raises him to the head of the church. And what did Judas do? Judas said, oh, I can't possibly be forgiven. And I, all these things, Satan would have been in his ear. And so he despaired and went out and hung himself. I often think, Judas could have been the apostle of mercy. Huh? Wouldn't that have been amazing? But not the case. So we have to learn from these lessons. Without Peter's fall, his love would remain weak. So don't feel bad when you go to confession and you have to confess horrible things. That's, if you allow experience of mercy to enter in, you will grow in love greater than what you were before you had the fall. And we too can only experience Jesus' mercy after we fall. The bigger the fall, the bigger the opportunity for mercy, providing we trust. Isn't that great news? I mean, it's not just good news, it's great news. I mean, it's really, you know, we're not, we're not perfect. We, we, we fall, but we just got to get up again and really understand God's mercy. Jesus said to St. Faustina, there is more merit to one hour of meditation on my sorrowful passion than there is to a whole year of flagellation that draws blood. You know that flagellation in the old days, they used to whip themselves? You could do that for a year to draw blood. And Jesus said, not as powerful as one hour as meditating on my passion because all the graces come from the cross he said few souls contemplate my passion with true feeling let the feeling enter into the passion of jesus it's really important i give great graces to souls who meditate devoutly on my passion it's not just for lent and easter all year round Okay, the second gift. We've got to keep an eye on the clock. The second gift is the hour of mercy. Jesus says, at three o'clock any day, implore my mercy, especially for sinners. And if only for a brief moment, immerse yourself in my passion, particularly in my abandonment at the moment of agony. This is the hour of great mercy for the whole world. I will allow you to enter into my mortal sorrow. In this hour, that's three to four, I refuse nothing to the soul that makes request of me in virtue of my passion. In the Philippines and in Poland, you can turn the radio on three o'clock, you hear the chaplet of mercy being prayed. If 
you can't say the chaplet of mercy, stop and think about Jesus' passion and just say, Jesus, I trust in you. Right? Or that other little prayer that took seven seconds to say, save us all. The third gift is the chaplet of mercy. My daughter, encourage souls to say the chaplet which I have given to you. It pleases me to grant everything they ask of me by saying the chaplet. Through the chaplet, you will obtain everything if what you ask be compatible with my will. So, most likely, you're asking, praying the chaplet for a Lamborghini. It's probably not the Lord's will. But we know for sure, if you're praying for the conversion of your son or your mother or your uncle or the man next door, it's definitely his will. So the, that prayer will be answered. Say unceasingly this chaplet I have taught you. Whoever will recite it will receive great mercy at the hour of death. There we go, back to the hour of death again. Priests will recommend it to sinners as their last hope of salvation. Even if there were a sinner most hardened, if he were to recite this chaplet only once, takes 10 minutes, once, he would receive infinite, he would receive grace from my infinite mercy. I desire to grant unimaginable graces to those souls who trust in my mercy. So this is the chaplet. Right? We say it on rosary beads. The, the main prayer here is where we would say, where we would normally say the Our Father, and this short little recitation is where we would normally say the Hail Mary. So you say one of those and ten of the others. So it's very quick. In fact, it's all over in ten minutes. And if you don't kind of get your thought together, you can think, I've said it, but I was thinking about something else through the whole thing. So it helps to focus on the passion of Jesus. But notice this, it's a prayer to the Father, right? Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. Boy, do we need a prayer like that now, to make atonement for the sins, our sins and those of the whole world. And for the sake of his sorrowful passion, all the grace comes from the cross. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Boy, do we need this prayer right now. This is a photograph that came out of a German prayer book. And what it is, is what happens at Mass. So I don't know if you can see it, but here's the priest bent over. But notice there's Jesus in the same body. So we talk about that uh, the priest, that Christ persona in the priest, Jesus is in the priest. That's why we respect the priest because the great dignity of his office, irrespective of the holiness of the priest, we respect them greatly because, and particularly at mass, where Jesus comes and does this. And what's happening? It's, we're not re-killing Jesus, it's once for all, we're offering Jesus the priest and Jesus is once again offering to the Father the passion and death of Jesus. So around the table we have the 12 apostles, the altar server here. But look at this. See all this? This is the heavenly host. Right. Angels and saints right up. I, it's a mate of mine, he's a priest and he's always saying, when Mass is said, it's, you're not said alone. It doesn't matter if there's only one person there. All the angels and saints are with us. And he has this acute sense that when he offers Mass, he's uniting with this worldly sacrifice. And, you know, look, even the souls in purgatory, and there's the congregation. That's me right there, see? And, um, so this is really powerful. And um, I put this up once many years ago, and I had so many people come up to me and say to me, that has transformed the way I see Mass. So I put it up every time now, because it's, it's really powerful. And that's why we can say, I offer you the body and blood. I mean, that's their powerful words. I offer you the body, blood, soul and divinity. All right. Where, how are we going for time? We're pushing a bit for time, so I'm going to push on a bit. Um, were a soul like a decaying corpse so that from a human standpoint there would be no hope of restoration 
and everything would have already been lost. It is not so with God. The miracle of divine mercy restores that soul in full. Oh, how miserable are those who do not take advantage of the miracle of God's mercy. You will call out in vain, but it will be too late. You will be forced to enter the door of justice where you will get what you deserve. This door at that point is closed. So that's why we want mercy. We want to embrace. Tell my priests that hardened sinners will repent on hearing their words when they speak about my unfathomable mercy and the compassion I have for them in my heart. Tell two priests to extol my mercy. I give them wondrous power and I anoint their words and touch the hearts to whom those they will speak. Tell sinners that no one shall escape my hand. If they run away from my merciful heart, they will fall into my just hands. Tell sinners that I am always waiting for them. Listen up. That I listen intently to the beating of their heart. When will it beat for me? Write that I am speaking to them through their remorse of conscience through their failures and sufferings, through thunderstorms, through the voice of the church. And if they bring all my graces to naught, I begin to be angry with them. How does God punish us? Well, he tells us right here, and we see this right throughout scripture. Leaving them alone and giving them what they want. Do they really, that's what they really want. They really won't respond to his mercy then if they want to play in the traffic, well, let them play in the traffic. But sooner or later, they're going to get hit by a bus. Souls who spread the honour of my mercy, I shield them through their entire life as a tender mother, her infant. And at the hour of death, I will not be a judge for them, but a merciful saviour. At that last hour, a soul has nothing to defend itself Accept my mercy. You won't be able to say, oh, it wasn't my fault, Lord. It was, you know, you do, you do an Eve or, or, or an Adam. Adam, Adam. Adam says, it was the woman you put next to me. Yeah? You can't be able to blame your spouse. You, you will be clear. Right? Happy is the soul that during its lifetime immersed itself in the fountain of mercy because justice will have no hold on it. Isn't that great news? All right, the fourth gift, and this is a huge one, and I've got 10 minutes to get it across to you. <laughs> my daughter, tell the whole world about my inconceivable mercy. I desire that the feast of mercy be a refuge and shelter for all souls and especially for poor sinners. On that day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open. I pour out a lot, no, a whole ocean of graces upon those souls who approach the fount of my mercy. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. On that day, all the divine floodgates through which grace flow are opened. Let no soul drop fear to draw near to me, even though its sins be as scarlet. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, what is going on here? Because there's a lot in this, right? We'll finish this bit and we'll open it up. Mercy, Jesus is saying, Jesus again, his words, my mercy is so great that no mind, be it of man or angel, will be able to fathom it throughout all eternity. Don't you just love these mind-blowing things that Jesus just throws out there? So in other words, Jesus is saying that there's angels in heaven are saying, how on earth did that guy get here? <laughs> right? And he got there because of the mercy of God, right? And so angels will be in awe of this for all eternity. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that great? The feast of mercy emerged from the very depths of my tenderness. It is my desire that it be solemnly celebrated on the first Sunday after Easter. 
and get this line this one is really potent for today mankind will not have peace until it turns to the fount of my mercy oh dear let's proclaim that throughout the whole world there's enough grace in heaven now to stop this war we just have to call on heaven right the grace is there you know there's a, there's a lady i know and she describes it well she says we catholics she says i describe them like the poor beggar who's out the front of the bank begging for food but he actually owns the bank and he doesn't realize he owns the bank he's out the front begging for food and if he realized the treasure that he already had he could just walk inside and live like a king well that's us catholics i'm afraid we have this great treasure and we, we're ignoring it all right let's have a look at this so divine mercy sunday is the octave of easter right it's the sunday after easter what do we do to get this gift first of all what is the gift the gift is complete forgiveness of sins now you're going to say well hang on oh, when i go to confession don't i get all my sins forgiven yes you do but we have what's called debt due to sin what is debt due to sin i'll give you an example i'm going to pick on my mate matthew here right say i walk past matthew's house right and he's got beautiful big windows at the front of his house and i pick up the house brick straight through the glass window smash to pieces right and i get home and i think you know i really shouldn't have done that to matthew he's a nice guy I really shouldn't have put the brick through his window so i go back and say listen matthew mate i'm, I'm really sorry about the window and matthew being a good compassionate person says that's all right paul i forgive you i say right thank you i'm out of here Matthew's going to say, oh, 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 uh, Paul, before, before you go, mate, there's, there's a big hole in the, in the window, you know. And, uh, or oh, I, I couldn't afford to get that repaired. I haven't got that kind of money. You get, you're getting the analogy, right? I couldn't afford that. So, well, could, could you put something towards it? Well, I don't really have any money. Well, could you come down and help the guys who are going to repair it? Can you see what I mean? There's a certain sense of justice that even though he's forgiven me, there's a certain sense of justice that I have to do some goodwill to uh, help to show my sincerity really to show my sincerity so the church teaches us that when we go to confession and confess serious sin we still have debt due to sin now penance goes a long way to removing that um, so we over the years this builds up right now the church in the past has said well we have plenary indulgence and some people say oh well, the divine mercy sunday is just a plenary indulgence uh, it's it's much more than a plenary indulgence as you will see it's a huge gift john paul got the theologians to examine it and they came back and said to him there's no gift in the church like this the only gift in the church like this is baptism if you get baptized as an adult all sin and all debt due to sin is completely wiped away and that's why in the early days of the church some communities were holding out on baptism until they were adults and the church said no 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 you can't do that you've got to baptize them as children so they have the grace to live through their teens so it's a huge huge gift right how do we get it okay we uh, celebrate the feast when we say celebrate the feast you don't really have to go anywhere you just have to be aware of it right sincerely repent of all our sins obviously place complete trust in jesus and go to confession you don't have to go on the day in fact it's probably good not to go on the day because i've been to some parishes where the church is packed and the poor priest up the back has got a queue of 40 people waiting for confession and some people get to the end so i don't even got the confession you don't have to go on the day you have to go um, either side of the day but the next thing says you must receive holy communion worthily on the feast so if you're not in a state of grace then obviously you have to go to communion before then so that you can receive venerate the image right jesus i trust in you right and this one's very important be mercy do, do a work of mercy through action words or prayers on behalf of some other person so that's what you've got to do and all sin and all debt due to sin is wiped away now some of you might be have led very holy lives but my early life wasn't something i necessarily want to wave up 
So this is wonderful. This is good news. I got a clean slate. Every year I get a chance to clean slate, wipe everything clean and, and start again. And this is what Jesus doesn't want us to worry about our past sins and all of this. That's why he gives it to us. But, and he's really driving home the point how, how powerful this is. Right? Some, um, some people call it a second baptism, but I don't like that expression because you can't get baptised twice. So. But what they're trying to say is the effects of this grace is like a baptism. John Paul II um, really understood this. And you remember when John Paul died, he died on the vigil of Divine Mercy Sunday. And I remember thinking, oh Lord, why didn't you just take John Paul a few hours later on Divine Mercy Sunday? Wouldn't that have made a bigger statement? But then I realised someone showed me, no, no, no. It was also the first Saturday of the month. And the other big thing that John Paul was part of his ministry was proclaiming um, Fatima and the devotion to Our Lady consecrated the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So by the first Saturday of the month, and being the eve, they said the Divine Mercy Mass had begun in the Father's Holy Father's room at eight, and he died at nine thirty-seven. So that that is a huge statement, showing uh, the importance of this message. Remember, some people say, "Oh, I heard, you hear people say crazy things," but God love them; they mean well. They say, "Oh, Divine Mercy Sunday, keep it in its place because we don't want it to overshadow Easter." Yeah. Easter is one big celebration. When we have major feast days, we celebrate octaves. We celebrate the octave of Christmas, right? So the octave of Easter, Easter is when the grace is won. Divine Mercy Sunday is when it gets out into the masses. It's all one big celebration and the fulfillment. So um, don't to get, get caught into that kind of thing. There's a big problem we have in English-speaking world. John Paul declared that the Feast of Mercy was not optional. One little word in the Latin got translated poorly in English, and now everyone thinks it's optional. It's amazing how Satan can get in on one little word, right? So the, the Latin decree was after the title Second Sunday of Easter, that's what it used to be called, there shall henceforth be added the appellation the translation from Latin to English was interpreted in English as or, but it's not. The, the correct translation of the Latin is that is Divine Mercy Sunday. And so throughout the whole English speaking world, you'll have people say, they look up their order and they say, oh, Divine Mercy Sunday is optional. We don't have to talk about it. It's not optional. But anyway, we do our best. This is Jesus talking about the deeds of mercy, how important it is that we do deeds of mercy. Okay, the other thing is, what's the difference between a plenary indulgence and the gift on Divine Mercy Sunday? So, a plenary indulgence uh, can only remove debt due to sin, never the sin itself. Whereas the grace of Divine Mercy Sunday removes both. And that is only found in baptism, as we said. Now, John Paul II granted a plenary indulgence on Divine Mercy Sunday. Why did he do that? He did that because a plenary indulgence can be applied for the souls in purgatory. The grace of Divine Mercy Sunday cannot be applied to those who are dead. Okay? So this, by John Paul doing this, this uh, made sure that um, the souls in purgatory also benefit. So, and one of the big problems with a plenary indulgence is you have to be detached from the sin. There's a great saint, I think it was St. Peter Nero. He, he got prompted to call the parish to do a plenary indulgence. And so they all did the prayers for the plenary indulgence. And Jesus said to him later, only two people got the plenary indulgence, an eight-year-old girl and yourself. So everybody else was still attached to their sin. So if you're attached to your sin, the plenary indulgence is not, doesn't work. That is not a condition for Divine Mercy Sunday. Now that's huge because we're all a bit attached to our sin, right? So again, it really is something special and something to celebrate. We're right on eight o'clock. 
Um, any questions? Don't be afraid, because probably somebody else will be thinking the same thing if you want to ask. No, no, it, it cannot be a the, it cannot be the, the indulgence can be applied to departed souls, but not the, not the grace. The grace is for the living. You with me? So a plenary indulgence can be applied for yourself to remove debt due to sin, or can be applied to somebody in purgatory. The grace of Divine Mercy Sunday cannot be applied. For the dead, it can only be applied for the living. So what, does that mean for the soul what? Sorry. What does that mean for the soul well, that means they can't. They can't benefit like we can. Like that. No. But you can still pray for them, like you can for any other time, right? But this is a, a huge grace, right? That on Divine Mercy Sunday, that you can be free of, right? But it does not apply to the souls in purgatory. That's why John Paul gave the plenary indulgence. Yes? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, but you don't... Yeah, so you're, to fulfil, you don't have to go to a special celebration, right? Not every parish has a special Divine Mercy celebration, right? I think in the Shire we only have one or two, something that celebrate, right? You can do this at home, but of course, obviously, you need to receive communion, right? And so you obviously got to go to mass. You got to go to mass anyway on Sunday. <laughs> but it's just a matter of of celebrating the feast. And now it's being aware of, of the gift and acknowledging the gift. Mm. Any more questions? Yeah. Just being with you on the earlier slide, you said Jesus. That's a great question. <laughs> the church is slow to move on these. This, the church is slow to move on private revelation. This is private revelation, right? So this was 1938, 1939, where Jesus asked Faustina for this. And he actually said, um, I will raise up a great, a great leader out of Poland who, who will, you know, so, and that happened, well, he became Pope, what, in 1978? So there's a long time there. Um, and in fact, that diary was actually banned. That diary had a terrible translation from one dear nun, Polish nun, whose Italian wasn't too good. And St. Faustina only had two terms of schooling. So her punctuation wasn't all that good. So you put that and you combine it with the poor translation. And they looked at it and things that Jesus was saying read like St. Faustina was saying. So the church says, oh no, we can't have that. So they banned it. Was banned. Jesus even pre Jesus predicted it would be banned, but he said it would come back. And the person responsible to get the proper translation and to undo all that mess, because it was 20 year ban, was John Paul II, when he was a bishop. And then, he, and then, six months after he lifted that ban, he became Pope John Paul II. So, but these things take time, and um, you know, just the way God works, <laughs> plants a seed and. No. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, abs absolutely. We can we can pray um, for whole groups of people. Is the prayer watered down? Possibly, possibly yes, possibly no. Um, I can't answer that without going off on a huge tangent. But um, in theory, yes, you can. But we need lots of people praying, right? We need the, the problem with the world today is, you know, they've decided that we're going to build civilization without God. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. 
and God just let it run and let it run and let it run. At some point, I personally believe he's going to have to intervene. All right? For the sake of the just, he's going to have to intervene. And, and um, you know, we need to just make sure we're doing our bit, that we pray. A lot of people, they, they don't know. The more we've given, the more we're expected. I, I, that line in scripture, it says, the more given on trust, the more will be expected. I, I, I shake when I read that, because I think, oh my gosh, I've been given so much. What have I done? Paltry, nothing, you know, in comparison to the gifts. And even just being a Catholic is a huge thing. So we all have our responsibility to pray for us and to pray for our neighbour and for our country. Yeah, I think. We can also show compassion and forgiveness just like Jesus did. It's just a a yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a work of mercy is an essential part of the feast, right? So you, you to show a work of mercy to somebody who needs it. You know, Jesus said, you, you can't expect me to be giving loving and gracious, and you're out there just taking and not and not being an apostle of mercy as well. You know, and that's that's what we're called to do: be apostles of mercy. Share this message with your family, your friends at home, those who have left the church. You know, and people say, oh, you know, I just have a mate say, oh, I can't go in the church, the church would fall down. I say, what, you think you're the only sinner? Like, you know, we've all got our stuff. But Divine Mercy Sunday is the, is the great time to come back. Just get it all wiped away and start again, you know. Just keep getting it. There was an old priest in here, Father Hannon. You remember Father Hannon? Some of you are old enough to remember. When I was a young man, I went into a priest and I asked him to hear my confession. He took me into that office heard my confession, it was a, I think it was a weekday or something, right? And he said to me, I'll never forget, he said, come, come any time. Come every day if you want. <laughs> I was astounded, right? Come every day. It's like, you know, that's beautiful, you know, that's, that's the mercy of God, you know? All right, we, I'm just conscious of the time, it's five, any more, yes? It's the only way we can get information on what you, even the diary uh, okay, so in, in that, I, I don't know if you heard earlier, but I said there's a piece of paper up the back. If you put your email on there, I will email you my notes. And there's a lot more in my notes than we covered, but it's got all those quotes. It's even got that picture of the mass. It's got um, there's heaps of stuff in there, resources. So, um, and you can buy the diary from any good Catholic bookshop, um, Divine Mercy in My Soul. You can. Um, I've actually got a soft copy online, I don't know whether that's legal or not, but I found it. You can just do a search and I've just downloaded it. But I love it because I can actually do a word search. If I'm trying to research something or look it up, I can just do a word search. And went, what did Jesus have to say about that? And you punch it in and you get all the things. So just Google it. Um, but it's, it's a great book and it's an easy read because you can just open anywhere and you just read and the bits that Jesus is in bold. And I, I just put it next to my bed and I just used to ring three or four pages a night. And over a period of time, I got through the whole thing. But it's, you know, you'll love it. It really is. It's great. It's inspiring. Yes? If the answer is genuine, the Divine Music publications were actually in Melbourne, you can Google you know, Divine Music Publications and you can find the Divine Music Publications. They have so many resources. They've got uh, videos on St. Christina's life, very good point. And I would encourage you to support the guy who runs that, this guy called John Canavan. Right? He's, a, he's a wonderful man. He's been through a lot of hard times in recent years, both financially and personally. And the man is very faithful to this message. So yes, support him because he deserves it. And um, uh, just you can buy all the stuff online. Um, it's Divine Mercy Publications Australia. And his name is John Canavan. Mm. He, he, John Canavan used to be a stand-up comic. And, and, and he, by his own thing, a, a pretty crude one. And then he had this massive conversion of divine mercy. And he, he just, he does what he does now, full time, spreading this message of divine mercy. He's a good man. Anything else? Any? All right, well, thank you so much for coming out in this terrible weather. And um, go and be apostles of mercy. Um, don't forget, put the name down for the notes so you've got all these resources. You can look them up. And um, thank you very much for coming. And um, for those who, if you want to stay, we, we can pray the chaplet. It will take about 10 minutes, but I understand a lot of people need to go. So please don't hesitate if you need to go. And I particularly want to thank... I particularly want to thank Father Greg. He put a lot of trust in me. He didn't really know me, and he, he allowed me to do this. So thank you, Father. And, um, you know, I don't have to tell you, you're so blessed to have this man 
Uh, this, you really are. You really are. Uh, thank you so much for a lovely talk. I, I confess I know very little about the diversity. Of course, I knew of the devotion, uh, but I've never read the diary and I know very personally very little about the devotion. However, I've known plenty of people whose lives have been transformed by it. Uh, and I think of one or two of my very cynical, atheistic friends who, by reading the diary, basically read themselves into the faith. So wow. I think this year will certainly have the mm. divine mercy devotions here in this mm. parish. Mm. But Paul, thank you ever so much for your time, for your faith and your witness, and for all that you do uh, for parishes around the Archdiocese. So thank you so thank much. Thank you, Pam. Thank you to your beautiful wife, too, for all the support that she gives you, and the witness that she is to, uh, to the faith. Uh, next Thursday, we have our Bishop Richard Umbers coming, uh, speaking on secrets of the spiritual life and the world of indifference. Uh, Bishop Umbers is a very tall man, uh, a very funny man, and a very bright man too. So please uh, please come on to that. Uh, he needs his birthday as well. His 51st birthday, so he's going to spend his birthday here at the parish. So that's very generous of him. Uh, please, yes, invite your friends. And thank you so much again for the effort that you've made to come out tonight. Uh, under such unpleasant conditions. Uh, but thank you again. We might just finish with the yeah. Father, those who like to say a prayer to Chaplain, uh, very and the Father, so Our Father, our Lord, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. May the blessing of the mighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit down upon you all and remain with you forever. Amen. Thank you so much.